Hello, and welcome to our financial aid presentation. By watching this recording, we are confident that you will have the information you need to guide you and your family through the 2023-2024 financial aid process. My name is Tom Miller, and I'm a financial aid advisor for Baker College. Although this is a recorded presentation, the Baker College financial aid advisors are always willing to assist you with your application questions. After watching this video, feel free to reach out to us via email at financialaid at baker.edu or by phone at 989-729-3911. During this presentation, I will cover a FAFSA overview, discuss how to get an FSA ID and explain what it's used for, provide specifics on completing the FAFSA, and provide a general overview of the different types of financial aid. Let's first talk about what exactly the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or FAFSA, is. The FAFSA is a tool typically completed online at studentaid.gov that collects demographic and financial information used to determine a student's eligibility for financial aid. When completing the FAFSA, the student lists which colleges they want the results released to. Up to 10 colleges can be listed on the application. However, one important tip to remember is that the first school listed on the FAFSA is where the state of Michigan is planning to send any state funding if you're considering attending an in-state college. If you end up not attending that college, be sure to update your college choice with the state of Michigan via the MISSG portal. Demographic information, such as your legal name, social security number, address, and date of birth will be requested for both the student and parents if applicable. Later in this presentation, we will cover when parental information is needed on the FAFSA. In addition to demographic information, 2021 tax information will be used to complete the 2023-2024 FAFSA. There are some general eligibility requirements that must be met in order for a student to be eligible for financial aid. Students must be a US citizen or a permanent resident. They must have completed high school or obtained a GED and students cannot be in default on federal student loans. Regardless of income, all students meeting the eligibility criteria will qualify for some form of financial aid, which includes grants and student loans. Therefore, we recommend everyone complete the FAFSA. Also, the FAFSA is an annual application, so you will need to complete this form every year while attending college. Upon submission of your FAFSA, an expected family contribution, or EFC, is calculated. The EFC is the result of a formula that the federal government uses to determine a family's ability to pay. The EFC will remain the same at all schools and will be used to determine how much need-based versus non-need-based aid will be offered to a student. While many people think of need-based aid as just a Pell Grant, that's untrue. The amount of need-based aid that a person could qualify for varies based on the school's cost of attendance. Other forms of need-based aid include some state grants, work study, and subsidized student loans. We'll discuss each of these in more depth. Ultimately, the schools will use the EFC from the FAFSA to determine what types of financial aid they can offer to a student. Now, when I introduced the FAFSA to you, the first word I used was free. You will never pay to complete the FAFSA. You wanna make sure you use the studentaid.gov website. If you're on a site and it's asking for payment, you are on the wrong site to submit the FAFSA. The FAFSA must be submitted every year, beginning on October 1st for the upcoming school year. So 2023 seniors, now is the time to do your FAFSA for the 2023-2024 academic year. As I previously mentioned, the 2023-24 FAFSA uses 2021 income information, so there is no reason to wait to complete your application. Some forms of financial aid are awarded on a first come first serve basis, so we wanna make sure you do your FAFSA right away. 
All right, let's dive a little more deeply into actually completing the FAFSA application. One of the most important items that will be needed to complete the FAFSA is a federal student ID or FSA ID. Both the student and one parent, if dependent, will need an FSA ID. Parents, if you already have an FSA ID that you've used to complete the FAFSA for yourself or another child, you do not need to create a new one. The FSA ID you already have assigned to you will work. If the student and her parent don't have an FSA ID, please create one right away at studentaid.gov under create an account. Now, please keep in mind that the FSA ID is the signature associated with the person's information entered to create the ID. Do not create the ID for someone else. Students should create their ID and a parent will, will create a separate ID for themselves. You'll provide answers to the verification questions that you will remember should you ever forget your FSA ID and need to recover it. When submitting for the FSA ID, make sure you correctly enter your social security number, name, and date of birth. These must match what is on your social security card. If one of these data elements don't match, it could mean the ID becomes invalidated. Additionally, each FSA ID must have a unique email address. Do not use a temporary email such as your high school email address. Link the FSA ID to a permanent email address. And finally, don't forget your FSA ID. This is the only account you will ever create and will be used from your first FAFSA submission through loan repayment. Unlike other websites, you will never be able to create a second account because your FSA ID is linked to your social security number. Now creating an FSA ID requires the creation of a username and password. When you begin creating the username and password, avoid using personal identifiers, for example, first name, last name, or date of birth. The username must be six to 30 characters long. You can use any combination of numbers and or letters. The username is not case sensitive. Now your password must be between eight and 30 characters long and contain one or more numbers, one or more uppercase letters, and one or more lowercase letters. Your password is case sensitive. You'll choose a username and password that you can remember, but that would be hard for others to guess. Now, having the FSA ID prior to completing the FAFSA will save you both time and frustration. So make sure you get that FSA ID prior to the FAFSA. Okay, so you have your FSA ID and you're on studentaid.gov. Under apply for aid section, you will click on complete the FAFSA form. If the student has never completed the FAFSA before, they will use the new to FAFSA process option. Once an application has been started and for all subsequent years, the returning user option is what will be used to access the FAFSA information. 2023 graduating seniors, please be sure you complete the FAFSA for the 2023-2024 academic year if you will be starting college in the fall of 2023. One thing to point out before we dive deeper into filling out the FAFSA is that every FAFSA user's experience is going to be slightly different. The FAFSA has skip logic built in and only asks you questions that pertain to your family's situation. Each answer you provide determines the future questions that you will need to answer. Throughout the FAFSA filing experience, you will see question marks next to each question. If you click on the question mark, additional text will be provided to help you with answering that question. The information provided is very useful, so I would suggest clicking those question marks whenever you are in need of assistance. Now, in order for schools to determine what financial aid you may qualify for, they need to have access to your FAFSA information. You determine which school receives that information by adding them to your FAFSA. Every school has a federal school code. Baker College's school code is 004673. You can list up to 10 schools on your FAFSA with the initial submission, but we recommend only listing those schools that you have a genuine interest in attending. 
If you change your mind, you can always correct your FAFSA to add additional school codes. Now remember, the first school listed on the FAFSA is where the state of Michigan assumes you're going to attend. If it is a Michigan school, that is where the state is planning to send state grants and scholarships. If you decide to attend a different school than what you originally listed on as the number one school on your FAFSA, you will need to update your school choice on the MySSG portal. Now, a common question we get when students are applying for aid is whether or not they need to include parental information on the FAFSA. There are 13 questions on the FAFSA that determine whether a student is a dependent or independent. If the student can answer yes to any one of those questions, they are independent. On this slide, I'm highlighting the six most common ways in which a student can be independent and not need to include parental information. You will notice this slide doesn't ask whether or not the student is living on their own or self-supporting. Typically, students are considered dependent and need to include parental information until they are 24 years old, married, or are supporting the dependent more than 50%. Now, there can be other unique situations that may warrant an otherwise dependent student to be determined to be independent. If there is documented abuse or neglect, financial aid offices can use professional judgment to perform a dependency override. If you are unable to answer yes to any of the dependency questions and have a unique situation, make sure to contact the financial aid office at the college you plan to attend for additional assistance. The next most common question we get when families are trying to complete the FAFSA is which parents information to use. The answer is you will include demographic and tax information for the parent or parents with whom the student lived with the majority of the time in the 12 months leading up to the completion of the FAFSA. If that biological or adoptive parent is remarried, the step parent's information must also be included. Only biological or adoptive parents, in the case of remarriage, the step parent information can be used on the FAFSA. Students should never include information for grandparents, legal guardians, or a family friend with whom they may be living with. We typically get a few follow-up questions when we present this information. The first is, but well, what if I didn't live with either parent, but I know I'm dependent? The answer is then you would include the parent's information for the parents who provided you with the most support. If you receive no support, it is the parents with whom would provide you support. We also get the question, what if my parents live together, but are not married? In this case, if both parents are your legal parent, you wouldn't provide information for both parents. Now, one of the first questions that you begin the FAFSA will be determining how many people are in your household. While this may seem like an easy question to answer, oftentimes families forget to include older children who are in college when they determine the household size. Be sure to include everyone that meets the criteria on this slide when you complete the FAFSA. Okay, now that we've figured out whose information should go on the FAFSA, let's talk about income information. Remember earlier how I explained that the FAFSA has skip logic built in? That is important because some families may be asked to provide both student and parent income information while others will only be asked for parental information. There may also may be times where you are instructed that you can skip questions. If you are presented with the option to skip questions, feel free to do so because entering information on those questions will have no impact on your expected family contribution. Now, in many cases, you will not need to manually enter your 2021 tax information on the FAFSA. The FAFSA has a tool called the IRS Data Retrieval, or DRT. If it is determined that you and or your parents are eligible to use IRS DRT, use it. The IRS Data Retrieval retrieves your 2021 tax information and transfers the information to the FAFSA. Using this option could save future frustration of having to supply tax information should the student's file be selected for verification. 
However, there are some situations when a student and a parent will not be able to use the IRS DRT functionality. A few examples include a change in marital status between when the 2021 taxes were filed and when the FAFSA is being submitted, or unmarried but living together parents who each file a separate tax return. A common question we typically get at this point is, what if I had income but wasn't required to file taxes? Uh, well, if you had income from work but were not required to file taxes, you'll be asked just to answer your income from work on the FAFSA. One final area where we get the most questions when families are trying to complete the FAFSA is about assets. Keep in mind, some families may not even get asked about assets. That's because the FAFSA has built-in logic that determines whether or not assets are going to change the expected family contribution based on the other income and household information that has already been entered. Some families will receive a question that asks if you have assets that exceed a certain dollar threshold for both students and parents. Knowing all of this, let's talk about what an asset is for financial aid purposes. Remember, you'll answer the questions as they are presented. You'll report answers individually for both the student and parents. The first one should be easy. How much is in cash, checking, and savings accounts? The second question about investments often leads to questions for families. So let's talk about what to include first. You would include real estate that is not the home that you live in, so rental properties would be considered an investment. Other investments include trust funds, UGMA and UPMA accounts, money market funds, mutual funds, CDs, stocks, stock options, bonds, other securities, installments and land sale contracts and commodities. 529 college savings plans also get reported, but who owns the fund determines how it gets reported. So be sure to read the student investment and parent investment links for more details. Also keep in mind that you report the net worth of these investments. So if you have a rental property that has a value of $100,000, but there's a mortgage of $90,000 on that property, then the net worth is only $10,000. Let me also clear up what is not an investment. Your primary residence that you live in is not an investment that needs to be reported. You also do not need to include the value of life insurance, retirement plans such as 401ks and 403bs, pension funds, annuities, non-education IRAs, or KEO plans. I wanna make sure that I'm clear that you do not include your primary residence or retirement and pension funds as an investment. Moving to the final asset question about businesses and investment farms, the term investment farm does not include the value of a family farm that you or your parents live on and operate. Additionally, a small business that your family owns and controls more than 50% and has fewer than 100 full-time or full-time equivalent employees is not included as an asset for FAFSA purposes. If you have an investment farm or business that does not meet these de definitions, please review the FAFSA for more instructions on determining net worth. All right, you did it. The FAFSA has been completed. But remember, you're likely not done with the financial aid process. After you submit your FAFSA, be sure to review your student aid report or your SAR, which you should receive in the via email in a few days after completing the FAFSA. If there's a problem or you need to make a correction, you'll return to studentaid.gov to make any necessary updates. Additionally, your schools may ask for more information. 30% of all applicants are selected for verification and need to turn in additional information to substantiate what was reported on the FAFSA. Be sure you know how your college is going to communicate with you, whether it'll be your personal email, your assigned college email address, a portal, or through the postal mail. At Baker College, we communicate via a college assigned email address, through a portal, and through the postal mail. The one thing that you want to make sure you get is your financial aid offer. The financial aid offer will tell you what types of financial aid you may qualify for at each of the schools where you sent your FAFSA results. Again, you will want to know how the school is going to communicate with you 
and what you need to do once the financial aid offer is received. Schools handle financial aid funds differently. For example, Baker College gives students the option to accept, decline, or ask for a reduction in loan amounts. Some schools may award work study as part of an aid package and expect that the student to find an on-campus employment as a way to pay their tuition. The point here is to make sure that you understand the financial aid offer and to ask questions if you don't. One final point to make is that we understand family situations change and job loss has been and continues to be a very real thing. If your family income has significantly changed since 2021, please talk with your financial aid office. We have the ability to perform professional judgment and can change FAFSA data elements to better reflect your family's current ability to pay. All right, now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. I've used a lot of terms as we have talked about the FAFSA, and I wanna make sure we all have a clear understanding of what exactly falls under financial aid. Financial aid is often thought of as just free money. However, when we talk about financial aid, we're talking about free money such as grants and scholarships, but we're also talking about work study and student loans. I will talk in more detail about federal and state aid on the next few screens, but I do want to point out here that many schools use the FAFSA information to determine eligibility for institutional scholarships. This is another reason why you want to complete the FAFSA and complete it early. Be sure to talk to the colleges that you're considering and attending about how scholarships are awarded as schools have different processes and deadlines. As I mentioned, when many people think of the term financial aid, they think of free money, grants specifically. There are several different grants available through the FAFSA application. The largest grant program is the federal Pell Grant. The federal Pell Grant uses a sliding scale based on the individual's expected family contribution. The closer the EFC is to zero, the larger the amount of Pell the student would receive. Although the 2023-2024 EFC and award amounts are not yet published, during the 2022-23 academic year, the EFC range for Pell Grant was between zero and 6,206. The maximum federal Pell Grant awarded this year was $6,895 for this academic year. Now, in addition to the federal Pell Grant, there is also a Federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant, or what's known as FSEOG. Now, FSEOG is designed to supplement the financial need of the lowest EFCs. Each college establishes policies for awarding FSEOG, so the amount that you receive at one college may differ from another. The state of Michigan also has a grant program called the Michigan Tuition Grant. The Michigan Tuition Grant, or MTG, is only available at private colleges such as Baker College. MTG is awarded to Michigan residents who complete the FAFSA by March 1st and are attending a private college in the state of Michigan. Now, MTG has a much higher EFC tolerance than the federal grant programs. While MTG is always dependent upon the state's budget, we are anticipating an award of $3,000 for each eligible student for the 2022-2023 academic year. The state of Michigan also funds the Tuition Incentive Program, or TIP. Students gain TIP eligibility based on Medicaid eligibility. For more information on TIP, visit the michigan.gov backslash mystudentaid website. It is important to note that TIP eligible students must certify eligibility prior to their high school graduation. One final thing to note about the State of Michigan grant programs is that the funds will be sent to the first school listed on the FAFSA. If you end up not attending that school, it's important for you to update your college on the MySSG portal. The other source of free money that families often want more information about are scholarships. Let me first say that your high school guidance counselor and your local community organizations are the best place right now for you to look for scholarship opportunities. Additionally, most colleges offer scholarships to students based on different qualifications. 
For example, at Baker College, we have some outstanding scholarship opportunities. For high school seniors, they range from our presidential scholarship, which covers your full tuition for four years, to our dean scholarship, which covers up to $4,500 per year. We also have generous scholarship opportunities for our transfer students. For additional information on Baker College scholarships, please visit baker.edu backslash scholarships. Make sure you're talking with the colleges that you're considering to attend to see what types of scholarship opportunities they have available and what needs to be done in order to receive those scholarships. You'll wanna start having those conversations now as some scholarships have deadlines, early deadlines that must be met. For example, our presidential scholarship has a December 15th deadline. One scholarship opportunity that is available from the state of Michigan is the Michigan Competitive Scholarship for MCS. A student must complete the FAFSA by March 1st. MCS does have both a merit and need component. Additionally, to qualify, the student and their parent, if dependent, must be a Michigan resident and attending a college in the state of Michigan. We are anticipating the 2022-2023 MCS award to be $1,500 $1, for this academic year. Now, as I already mentioned, your local organizations are a great place to research to start your scholarship search. Keep in mind that some scholarships have very early application deadlines. These deadlines could be as early as your sophomore or junior year in high school. Don't be afraid to apply for scholarships, even if you think you've remotely qualified. You never know when luck might be on your side and you win that scholarship. In addition to local area scholarships, we also encourage families to talk with employers about scholarship opportunities or tuition reimbursement programs. Have you ever looked at the McDonald's Tuition Assistance Program? If not, check it out, it's pretty generous. This is just an example of work, even part-time work that may have added benefits. There are also many search engines that will help you identify scholarship opportunities. The one thing I would caution is that you should never have to pay to find a scholarship. Shifting gears, I wanna take a minute or two to talk about work study. Work study is a form of financial aid that is earned from working either an on or off campus job. Sometimes work study is referred to as self-help aid because you are paid an hourly rate just as you would be at any other job. Those earnings are then either paid to you via a paycheck or they get applied towards your balance at the college. In order to qualify for work study, the student must be attending classes, except during periods of non-enrollment. Federal work study also requires the student have need based on the FAFSA application. If the college offers institutional work study, that may be more flexible and not require the need component. Colleges all handle work study differently. Some award it, expecting the student to find the job via their job postings. Others don't award it, but post jobs and if the student is interested, determine if they are eligible. If, if you're interested in work study, be sure to understand how your college handles that process. Work study is a great way to gain work experience. Typically students enter the, into these positions with the employer having the understanding that they need to work around their student schedule. Uh, it's a great way to make connections, build a reference list, earn money and learn life skills. We've now talked about grants, scholarships, and work studies. Let's take a few minutes to also discuss student loans. We always like to start this section by advising that loans should be a last resort option. You wanna explore all other options, including payment plans before, before turning to student loans. The less debt that you can occur, the better. That being said, the Federal Direct Stafford Loan Program is a nice program for those who need to borrow. Students who borrow are building credit on debt that doesn't need to be repaid right away. The Federal Direct Stafford Loan Program offers two types of loans to student borrowers. The FAFSA is what makes students eligible to borrow under the Federal Direct Loan Program, so long as they meet the other eligible student criteria. With both types of loans, the student is the borrower. No cosigner or credit is needed. 
Repayment on both these loan types begins six months after graduation or six months after the student stops attending at least half-time status. The federal direct subsidized loan is based on having financial need, which the EFC helps to determine. Subsidized loans are interest-free while the student is in school. The federal direct unsubsidized loans are not dependent upon need. Unsubsidized loans accrue interest while the student is in school. However, while it's not required that the interest be paid while they're in school, we do recommend paying their interest while you're in school to keep your student loan debt as minimal as possible. While the interest rate on these loans are fixed each year, they do change yearly based on the treasury bill. The interest rate for the 2022-2023 academic year is at 4.99%. Now the amount of money that a student can borrow is capped each academic year. As you can see from this slide, dependent freshmen are capped at $5,500 for the year. That dollar amount does increase slightly as the student progresses through their education. In total, a dependent student can borrow no more than $31,000. If the amount the student can borrow is not enough to cover costs, there are private loan options available through lenders. Oftentimes, the private loans do require co-signers. There are many different private lo loan lenders who offer different loan products. We wanna encourage you to do your research before deciding on a private student loan. There is one final federal loan option available to help, cover, to help cover college costs. This option is called the Federal Direct Parent Plus Loan. The key word for this loan is the word parent. The Parent Plus Loan is a loan that the parent, not the student, is responsible for repaying. The PLUS loan is credit-based, but parents are typically only denied if they have poor credit history. Income and debt are not a consideration in the PLUS loan approval process. Now, the amount the parent can borrow is dependent on the, students, on the school's cost of attendance and other aid that the student has received. Repayment of a PLUS loan does begin while the student is still in college, but the parent can defer those payments until graduation or until the student stops attending at least half-time status. The parent would need to work with their lender to defer payments. If the option to defer payments is selected, we do still encourage the parent to pay the interest while the student is in school. Uh, in 2022-2023, uh, the Parent PLUS loans had an interest rate of 7.54%. The schools have different Parent PLUS loan processes. If you need to borrow a PLUS loan, be sure to consult with the school on their process. Many schools will direct students to studentaid.gov to apply for the Parent PLUS loan. Now we have covered a great deal of information in our presentation. Some of you may still be wondering how much college is going to cost and exactly how you're going to pay for it all. Let me first say, we understand. Investing in higher education is just that, an investment, but it can be the best investment for your future. Every school has a net price calculator that can help you to understand how much attending their school is going to cost. and may even give you an estimate of the amount of financial aid you could receive. Take a look at our net price calculator. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at Baker College's affordability. This is an example of the results screen from our net price calculator. For this example, the student indicated that they will live at home with their parents and they have a 3.5 high school GPA. You will see that the, you'll see that the direct costs are $12,624. Now direct cost represents the estimated amount that the school will charge. In this case, the only charge is tuition and fees. Below that, you'll see additional costs listed. These are not charges paid to Baker College. The books and supplies are an estimated amount and would be paid to Barnes & Noble or another bookstore you select. Since the student is not living in campus housing, you may wonder what the room and board and other expenses are. In this example, they are simply estimates of your cost of living expenses. They are not additional costs you will have to uh, incur in order to attend college. 
In this student's case, the added costs for the college is $13,624, which includes tuition, fees, and books. I wanted to share this information with you so that you realize that when you're reviewing the cost of attendance information from any college, remember to read the fine print in order to determine what is the cost charged by the school and what is not. Now the screen on the right shows that the amount of financial aid you may qualify for. In this case, the grants and scholarships come to $13,624. In other words, this student will have no added cost because the $13,624 in tuition, fees, and books is completely covered by grants and scholarships. The student also has eligibility for work study, which can help offset some of the living expenses. Again, I highly recommend that you check the net price calculator for any school you plan to attend. Of course, we'll always encourage you to check ours out at baker.studentaidcalculator.com. Now, I wanna thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation and think about financial aid in the FAFSA. Please remember, regardless of where you're considering going to school, we are here to help you. Please do not hesitate to reach out to us should you have specific questions when completing the FAFSA or general questions about financial aid. Best of luck to you as you venture into the next phase of life. Thank you.